evening, everyone. It is from New Hampshire Dog Walking Club headquarters, and I am here tonight with Kelly Dwyer of Nature Education Opportunities. How are you, Kelly? I'm doing well, Tracy. How are you tonight? Very well, thanks. Good to see you again. You as well. I know we had a few technology glitches here tonight, which always <laughs> seems to be an issue. As much as we love technology, sometimes it doesn't always do for us what we want it to. So thank you for your patience tonight, everybody. We do have a fun topic that we are bringing to you tonight, something that you may not have normally thought about when you are getting ready to feed the birds as we get to December 1st here, which is kind of the date that mm -hmm. New Hampshire Fish and Game have been telling us is kind of the safe point this year due to the mild weather. We want the bears to be, you know, cozily getting ready for their sleep before we put out uh, the bird feeders. So that time is here. So this is very timely. And what Kelly and I are gonna be talking with you tonight is safe bird feeding stations, not only for birds, but for pets. There may be things that you haven't considered when you are getting your pet, your, your bird feeders and the types of seed and placement of the different bird feeders together and ready. So we wanna give you some of those best practices when you do this. Now, I love working with Kelly. You may remember her from some of the nature walks that we've done this year, uh, specifically the birding ones, which have been very well attended. And we have another one coming up this Saturday back down at Massabesic Audubon Center. And we'll make sure we tell you more about that at the end of this broadcast. Uh, Kelly and I used to work together at the New Hampshire Audubon, and that is where I met her and loved everything that she had to teach me and all of the good work that she was doing with uh, elementary schools and the grants that she was awarding. And I've worked with her in a number of capacities. And I'm really excited to be working with her again in this capacity. So I know we have a lot to get to you, a lot of great information. So I want to um, get right into it, Kelly, but can you tell us a little bit about what you do at Nature Education Opportunities? Sure. Well, thank you again for providing this platform for all of us to learn more about nature and connect with nature, especially out on the trails with our dogs. So I founded Nature Education Opportunities back just this May. It's been a dream of mine to have my own nature education uh, company. So I thought, well, let's just jump right in and do it. So I work a lot with adults, with school kids, and sharing my passion for the outdoors. And I find that most people I meet, the big hook for them are birds because they are available 365 days of the year, 24 seven, really, if you're out like I am in March at three in the morning, listening for owls. So birds are always visible. And I think that's really the hook. Um, so again, my mission is to connect people with nature, people of all ages. There's so much to see, so much that we can benefit from a health standpoint, from a calm relaxation standpoint. So that's really what I'm all about. And I'm so excited again to be partnering with Tracy and the dog walking community. I've met so many wonderful people with our walks and Saturday looks fabulous to get back out on those trails. So again, we'll, we'll go over the details at the end of the show, but hope to see more of you back on the trails again. I met quite a few really fabulous people back in the springtime when we walked these trails. So it will be kind of fun to see how things are really different now in December as opposed to May. Well, Kelly, I love that you go out at 3 a.m. to see owls. I used to go out at 4 p.m. for whippoorwills. So, <laughs> <laughs> or four, I should say 4 a.m. for whippoorwills. So, yeah, you get up for those good bird sites, you, you know? <laughs> then you have coffee waiting. That's, That's right, exactly. <laughs> so, Kelly, I know um, some of the things we're going to be talking about with people today are fascinating winter adaptations birds undergo to survive our winters, mm -hmm. birds that migrate to New Hampshire for the winter and how to recognize them, tips for successful backyard winter bird feeding, and then uh, ball, oh, no, I'm sorry, this is, I'm looking at the walk for this weekend. I'm like, what are you talking about? Ball I didn't know that. Hold on. <laughs> I'm on the wrong one. Let me go to the right one here. Sorry, guys. I had a couple different screens open and I confused myself. So let me tell you what we're going to be talking about tonight, not on Saturday. So tonight we're talking about the variety of birds you can expect to visit at your uh, New Hampshire bird feeders or Massachusetts, wherever you're tuning in from unique strategies they use to adapt and survive the winter, best feeder types and seeds to attract avian guests, tips to address challenges such as pesky squirrels and window strikes, and ways to keep pets and birds safe from other potential hazards. 
So Kelly, I'll let you jump right into it with our first topic. Okay, great. Well, if we can kind of sort of back out for a moment and think about what our birds doing right now as we're ready to roll into December tomorrow. So um, if you think about over the course of a, a year in nature, birds are all about nesting and rearing young in the spring, claiming those territories, they're singing, they're chasing each other. So there's lots to see and hear in starting in March, April, May, Many of the birds that we enjoy over the summer are those that have migrated up from warmer climates down in Florida, even into the, um, the midsection of our country, as well as Central America and South America. So they're competing for nesting space, resources to raise young. And then over the course of the summer, those young birds are becoming quiet as they're learning those skills to be adults. Come fall, we have migration of many of the birds that moved up here in the spring to, to really create those ideal nesting territories. So now we're left with what we call our resident birds. These are birds like many of you will notice. And, and Tracy and I, well, we were kind of laughing as we were getting frustrated trying to get a PowerPoint that I had ready for you folks to load. Of course it wouldn't. So um, I, as a teacher, am always ready with some pictures and some other props. So I did pull out a couple of, um, sort of pictures that I can show you of what we call the resident birds. These are those birds that are with us pretty much all year round. And many of you will recognize, uh, for example, this dear little black capped chickadee, which is kind of one of my favorites. You can see and hear this chickadee any day of the year. It's uh, You go out on a real blustery January day and most likely you will have a chickadee greet you and let you know that there is life in the woods. So these are the birds that we will be putting our feeders out for. and. Just to be clear, uh, feeding the birds, it's not something that they are dependent on us. It's almost like a little bonus, but they can survive pretty readily without the food that we're offering them at our feeders. It's more for our entertainment and our enjoyment. So um, again, the cardinal is a classic one that people love to see at their feeders. The well, Kelly, I'm just wondering if we can ask our audience of the birds that you attract to your feeder uh, in the winter, which is your favorite? As Kelly's going through all these great birding species with us, do you have a favorite that you look forward to seeing every year? I know I do. <laughs> so let us know in the comment section. That would be wonderful. So we have, again, those resident birds that we see all year and now they're, they're here with us. And then we also, let's kind of throw this one in the mix. This actually is my favorite one. So we can put that in the poll, Tracy. Yep. Yeah, the, yeah, the dark-eyed junco that, believe it or not, this bird is a high elevation nester that is, is migrating down to join us in New Hampshire and down in Massachusetts and Connecticut and a little bit further south for the winter. So we, again, we think of migration as leaving New Hampshire and going further south. We have birds that leave the tundra, leave the northern elevations and stay with us throughout the winter. I know. Don't you love that, Kelly, that there's actually a species that considers New Hampshire South? Yeah, right. <laughs> and that's why they call this one the dark eyed junk of the snowbird, because, um, you know, when you hear about people that move to Florida or stay there for the, the wintertime, they're called snowbirds. So that is actually the nickname of the junk is the snowbird. Love it. Yeah. Well, Kelly, we've got a few people here. So Marianne says she looks forward to the Cardinals and that's my favorite bird as well. Yeah. Um, Another person, uh, the dark-eyed junco. Um, yep, that's that's also a great one. And Judy says she loves all types of woodpeckers and bluebirds. Okay, yeah, all yeah. species. Well, Judy, um, if you do not have a feeder up to attract bluebirds, I have a tip for you in, in a little bit further on in the show that I have a food source that you can get that the bluebirds cannot resist. It's like me when I go to Van Otis Chocolates. It's, it's just <laughs> in the candy store. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so those those again are um some of the types of birds that we should be seeing now so maybe we could chat for a moment about how do the birds survive the winter in new hampshire because there are some amazing adaptations that um and if you do join us on the walk on saturday we'll get into much more detail with pictures i promise you the pictures will be there there's nothing that will kind of uh, bug, bug bug out on us on uh technology but think about the cold, uh, really bitter winds and temperatures that are oftentimes plum plummeting to sub-zero at night. So birds this time of year have actually adopted more, they've grown more feathers, more breast feathers. They fluff those feathers out. So sometimes in midday, you'll see maybe 
a junco or a tip mouse or a chickadee sitting on a branch and it looks enormous, like a big pom-pom ball. So they're fluffing those breast feathers to trap the, the warmth of their, um, their body in their feathers. That's why we love down jackets. It has the same effect for us. And birds at night oftentimes will roost together. I was watching the bluebirds in my yard. There were five males and one female that were going into one of my nest boxes. So they'll huddle together at night for warmth, almost like those penguins we see pictures of in the Antarctic. In another adaptation, is they will lower their body temperature at night, not quite to hibernation, but torpor. So they slow their respiration, bring their body temperature down, and they kind of go into a semi-dormant state overnight to conserve energy. And the other strategy they use is to constantly be feeding and storing food during the daylight hours, especially this time of year as we get into that real limited window of daylight. So the birds at your feeder, you'll notice these frenzy patterns of feeding morning they're there at the crack of dawn and they are just constantly feeding for an hour or two and then things become kind of quiet some of you i hope in the audience are kind of nodding you've noticed that pattern they're resting digesting kind of storing that energy and then they'll come back for another couple of rounds of feeding before that last frenzy as dusk is starting to approach and of course for our cardinal favorites out there, that's the last bird you typically see in the evening before the sun sets as the, as the male cardinal, kind of in that waning light, his beautiful uh, red feathers. Yeah, agreed. And I think we've got a, a couple other favorites here. Let's see. Uh, Christine loves the bluebirds. She just bluebird. saw one today. That's a score for sure. That's awesome, uh, Christine. Patty, yeah, Patty loves the hummingbirds. Wish they stayed around all year. <laughs> yep, me too, but... <laughs> And actually, that it's interesting. Feathers, do they? They like actually, the um, they're pretty adapted. They could survive, but unfortunately, the, there's no food source for them. So that yeah. migration is all driven by available availability of food. Um, so you think about little insects they eat, as well as the the nectar and flowers. All of that's gone. So that is really what drives migration: is availability of food. Yeah, good point. Jamie says, I saw a pileated woodpecker on a feeder at a client's house a couple of weeks ago. It was amazing. Oh, those are beautiful birds. Gorgeous. For those of you who are kind of not sure what that looks like, it's a crow-sized uh, woodpecker, black, with what I call as a red party hat. Like if you think of one of those party hats that kids love to wear, and a huge bill that's really adapted to just thunder into a cavity of a tree. And Kelly, you'll love this one. On our last club walk to the Hampton Beach, we actually saw a snowy owl in the dunes. That was quite a treat. So beautiful. I was uh, with a friend of mine who loves to bird today, and she was saying she went over to Salisbury Beach in Massachusetts and saw her first snowy of the season this past weekend. Again, a high Arctic bird that their migration is all really driven by the lemming population. If the population of lemmings is low, then you have a lot of younger birds that are migrating down here to find food. Um, and if you think about them flying over the, our beach areas, our dune areas, it looks like the Arctic tundra. So it looks like home for them. So that's why they're successfully staying here over the winter because it's a similar hunting ground that they're used to in the high Arctic. Oh, wow. Okay. Very interesting. And let's see, we've got, um, yeah, Jamie was saying about the pileated woodpecker. It was huge, literally right outside of her window. So when oh, you, you, you stop you and you take pause and you just, Take those few seconds to admire that that view, you know? And you know what, Tracy? That's why I love backyard bird feeding because it, it's giving you permission to sit down, to grab a cup of coffee or tea and just look out the window. That is the best thing for your stress level, for your blood pressure. And you're, you're really contributing to science because there's lots of different things you can do as a citizen scientist, lots of things that come up over the course of the winter for collecting data and bringing it to Cornell or um, Audubon's do the winter uh, backyard bird count. So um, it, you can give yourself permission to relax because you're participating in science. Yeah, so I think when you said that the birds don't really need us to feed them, it's that we need them. We, we do. need that connection, we need that beauty, you know, so. Yeah, <laughs> yeah absolutely. All right, so that's all the comments we have right now. Okay, great. Um, so maybe what we could do then, Tracy, is we've talked about some of the birds that you could expect to see. We've talked about the winter adaptations. Let's um, maybe chat because I'm really curious what you have to contribute as far as keeping things really pet friendly, especially where, um, you know, dogs are outside kind of relieving themselves or spending time in the yard. So maybe what we could do is I'll talk about 
some of the food and the feeding options, um, as well as some of the challenges, and we can kind of weave in how to keep your pet safe, because I think that obviously is a critical component. Yeah, um, that'd be great. Okay, great. Well, let's kind of, if again, I had some nice PowerPoints to envision feeders, but um, one of the best things to do, I think about bird, bird feeders as almost a restaurant. So when you go to a restaurant, you want a variety of food because it's it's what brings you in there. You'd like to have sort of a takeout option as well as a sit down. So if we think of some of the birds, like for example, the cardinals, I look at those as diners that like to come in and grab a booth, stay for a little bit, where a chickadee is more of a takeout feeder. So it will land, grab a seed and fly away. And feeding birds to have the best success, it's nice to offer that variety. So black oil, let me see, I'm gonna kind of open that up and I hopefully I won't spill it all over my laptop. But if you can kind of see, I'll give some contrast. This little baggie of black oil sunflower is probably your best bet because most birds love this. I've even seen the woodpeckers grabbing seeds and trying to open those um, little black oil sunflower seeds on my platform feeders. And then this one for my bluebird fans out there, the dried mealworms. And you can kind of see those in my hand. Oh, you can delicious. I know, right? <laughs> my, when my daughters first saw that arrive, like, why, why do we have five pounds worth of dried worms? <laughs> because I want those bluebirds. So That's you right. can go on Amazon, you can go to Agway, you can get dried mealworms pretty regularly now, especially um, with the population of backyard chickens increasing. These are much more available, but bluebirds cannot resist them. Great source of protein and energy for them. And then I think another thing that is one of the favorites of most of the birds, including bluebirds, woodpeckers, chickadees, are the suet feeders. So here I have like just the simple little suet cage. You can get them at Ocean State or, um, or at Agway, some of your feed stores, tractor supply. And then the suet cakes, you get those again. They're kind of like the, I call them the prefabricated ones. There's little fun seeds in them for birds within beef fat. So it's a ready-made just open it up, slot it in, or you can actually get pure beef suet right in the butcher shop or the meat department at the stores, um, which is nice because squirrels are not necessarily attracted to that. So um, we'll talk in a moment about that is probably one of the biggest challenges of backyard bird feeding is, is those squirrels that um, seem to outwit us at every turn. But so offering a variety of food, you can offer peanuts, you can offer um, mixed nuts, mixed seeds, Millet is another one, these tiny little seed balls. A lot of people actually uh, use millet in like an oatmeal. So it's kind of something great to scatter on the ground for those juncos. Any of those ground feeders love millet. You'll see them scratching around under the snow, especially to try to get seeds. So offering a variety of food and having a variety of feeders. You Again, we mentioned the suet uh, feeder. Having a tube feeder, those are those cylindrical feeders that have different ports and maybe a little um, kind of like a little stick or a perch, depending on the, the size of the bird. Those are a nice option. One of my favorites is what I call the platform feeder. So if you can think about like just a um, almost like a, a square that has maybe an inch long um, kind of band around it and it hangs by four chains. So you can kind of fill that with a variety of seed and that allows those birds like the cardinals, the morning doves, some of those more perching birds just sort of stay and eat. I think of that as the um, the table or the booth at the diner. <laughs> and um, I recently got some of these plexiglass feeders that suction cup right onto my windows or a slider. And it's really fun. I have one on my kitchen window. So the chickadees and I've had bluebirds come to it. So as I'm kind of, you know, washing the coffee pot, I can look right right out the window and see those birds approach so you can kind of see them close up and they do get used to you after a little bit of time so those are kind of some of the feeder options but offering a variety having um i have a couple of feeder poles that i have mounted right into the ground and then it's really critical to avoid squirrel problems to have a baffle and what a baffle is it, it looks like almost like a metal pie plate or something that goes the pole goes through it so it provides a barrier for squirrels that are trying to shimmy up the pole to get to the feeders. So that's one way to avoid squirrel frustration. Another tip for squirrels is to make sure that your feeders are at least seven to 10 feet 
away from any launching pad. So I, I've actually had to go out and trim a couple of branches because I've seen the squirrels, you know, kind of, they, they hover there and they wait and then they can launch themselves. Um, occasionally there's the Olympian that gets past everything I do. I've had a couple of those squirrels where I've, I've, they've outwitted me at every turn. But once you get your feeder set up and you have that barrier from squirrels, then um, you're pretty safe without being um, bothered by them. But um, so I'm curious, Tracy, now with the, the pole feeder set up, and if you have your dogs outside, say on a long run, what would you advise folks um, to sort of keep the dog safe from maybe that threat of wrapping them, you know, their, their leash or their lead around the pole if they're out bounding around the yard? Yeah, the, well, there's a couple key things that I want to uh, talk about in regards to what you were mentioning with the seeds and stuff. Granted, yeah, you want to be really careful when tying your dogs outside, if your dogs are on a run of some sort, to make sure that is a good distance from your feeders and where feed might be dropped out by the birds. If your dogs are loose, like ours are in an electric fence area, there's different things that we have to do to make sure they're safe. Now, a, a small amount of seed that dogs might eat is safe um, to a certain extent. And this, this is information that's coming from the AKC. So I know it's very credible, very reliable. So I want to start there with the types of seed that you mentioned, uh, Kelly. The, the biggest thing to know or to keep in mind is to always make sure you have fresh seed, dry mm -hmm unmolding seed, both for the birds, but also yep. for your pets, because there is a thing called aflatoxin poisoning that can happen when dogs eat moldy bird seeds. And then that's a nasty, nasty thing. So that can mm -hmm. lead to uh, all types of, uh, uh, it can lead to uh, poisoning in dogs. And the way you would see that is by your dogs being um, sluggish, loss of appetite, vomiting, jaundice, uh, diarrhea, and this is all according to the FDA. So if your dog is a scrounger, I do have one that is, she'll go out in the woods and eat deer poop and all kinds of fun things. You know, be aware of these things. Make sure your seed is fresh. Keep an eye on your dogs when they go outside and also watch for these symptoms that you might mm. see because it could be this aflatoxin poisoning. Now, it can also cause um, upset stomach and blockage in the intestinal tract that can lead to bloat. Uh, one of the veterinarians I worked for back in my college days, we actually had a mastiff that came in with a, a blocked colon. And I, all I remember is this dog stretched out on the surgery table. It was humongous. They were able to get everything out of the intestines and the colon, but I mean, it was, it was a lot of packaged bird seed in there. So very, very dangerous. So uh, again, only use fresh seed and always read the ingredients to be sure there's nothing harmful in the mix. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know, Kelly, um, I, I'm not a veterinarian and I don't know if you know, I know some of the stuff that you mentioned, the AKC is okay in very small amounts. Some of the other uh, other things like millet and stuff like that, I, I'm not aware. Do you know? I don't know um, where it's a natural seed that you'd find, you know, sort of along the roadside. So, um, and I suspect it, the, it's more the, the molding aspect of seed on the ground, which I'm glad you said that, Tracy, because what I would recommend for birds is to be cleaning your feeders uh, every other week. Uh, what I do it at night, I empty them out into either, you know, way in the woods or a trash can. And then I, I submerge them in a, in a uh, bleach water part solution, one part bleach, nine part water. And I soak them for about 10 or 15 minutes. I have a scrub brush dedicated just to that, scrub them down, rinse them well, dry them before I restock the, the seed. So I suspect by having um, the feeder types that maybe don't have as much spillage on the ground. So maybe some of those tube feeders, a good platform feeder, um, that you can kind of control how much is going onto the ground. What I do too to keep the birds safe on the ground is I have uh, a little dedicated rake and a dustpan so that I'm constantly cleaning up underneath the bird feeder situation. Like every couple of days I go out and I really rake it all up and I'll either throw it in the woods or throw it out. So I kind of keep things fresh. So that might be something, a tip that um, some of the folks that would be concerned about their dogs, if they are scroungers, like you said, to make sure that you're providing that extra level of cleanliness underneath your feeders by doing that. 
Yeah, those are great idea. Another uh, another one that the AKC suggested was use a screw on tray under the feeder to keep seeds from hitting yeah. the ground in the first place. Right. So, you know, I can see you have your bird feeder, mm -hmm. you have your collection tray, if you will. Mm -hmm. And then maybe under that you have your squirrel protection. So there's three layers instead of the two layers that maybe we're right. normally used to. Yeah, yeah. And I think, again, if you're new to setting up a bird feeder station, just to obviously do your due diligence, kind of, you know, your pets best, you know, your dogs, their behavior. So keep an eye on, you know, if they're going underneath the feeders and just kind of keeping an eye on things for a little bit. Um, and I, I, maybe some there might be a possibility if your dog is on a run to sort of have the, the feeder situation away from the run, especially initially, or just really kind of monitor the situation and obviously, I think your dog's health would come first. So if you feel like this is really not a good option and it's risky, then I would suggest just remove your feeders. Start small if this is something new, maybe a pole and one or two feeders and see how it goes before making a, a larger investment in the, um, the different feeders as well as the seed. Yeah, those are great ideas as well. Um, a couple other things that I found here that I actually hadn't thought of before that I really like. I think you'll like this one, uh, Kelly. Create a barrier under the feeders or plant a dog-friendly bed of ground cover that makes the seeds harder to find. So yeah, that I, you know. Well, and some of the things that were suggested were some different types of vegetables that might still provide mm -hmm. green in the winter, as well as things like blueberry and raspberry bushes that might have some prickle pricklies on it too. So your dog's not going to want to get in under that. So I thought that was a neat idea. No, that's a really good idea. And one of the things that I think is important from a bird perspective is to provide that sort of sheltered areas so that they can escape predators like hawks um, that tend to be part of the food chain, the food web within a bird feeding situation. And once the hawks discover that there's easy pickings, there are birds that only survive on eating small songbirds, like the ones you'd be attracting to your feeders. So you tend to have an uptake in the hawks there and birds need that added protection, that, that area where they can shelter. So maybe something right kind of ringing around your feeders that will keep, keep your dogs away, but also provide some shelter for those birds. It's kind of a, a you know, you check two boxes there with that. Yeah, absolutely. I know that, um, you know, the cardinals that I was talking about, they constantly frequent the barberry that's outside my window. Now I know that's an invasive, yeah. but boy, that's a great, you know, bush for cover from a bird feeder. Right. <laughs> yeah. Um, water. And one thing that I do, um, I love to go around after Christmas and sort of collect the live Christmas trees that are putting out for uh, the pickup. And I tether them to different trees around my property to create that little bit of shelter for birds. So um, that might be something to consider too, if you have a natural Christmas tree, a live tree, to put that close by um, for the birds protection. I'm not sure what that means in terms of dogs with, if there'd be an issue with, um, I don't, I've never heard of anybody that has a problem with a dog ingesting the balsam or the Fraser fur or any of that material, but I've never heard of that either. No, I, I, so I don't think that would be a concern, but that might be another way to kind of deter uh, your dog from, from rummaging around under the feeders to think about sort of the Christmas tree aspect after the fact. Yeah, we do that as well. And I really like that idea. We put it in our garden area, which is fenced. So the dogs can't get in there. And then the kids will make uh, ornaments every yeah. year with peanut butter and bird seed and they'll hang it on the tree so that we use the tree after we're done using it so in January when it gets you know pretty cold the birds have a good protein source and the dogs can't get to it because those ornaments would be completely eaten if the dogs <laughs> could get to them. <laughs> um, one other thing I want to mention from um, and this I'll be curious with your take on this is Fresh water is really vital because especially for attracting birds, having a heated bird bath or some type of other fresh water supply, that's a real bonus for birds. And they'll tend to favor your yard over somebody else's if there is fresh water available. I'm not sure, again, what that means for a dog outside. If there's a heated bird bath, would that be potentially a problem? I don't foresee that it would. Uh, might be a, a drinking source for the dog, right. but yeah, I haven't heard of anything and couldn't find okay. any uh, research on it. Okay, great. And again, I dump mine out every day. I just take a scrub brush, swift it around real quickly and, and keep fresh water there. Otherwise the water can get, you know, a little bit gunky. Yeah, so that's the key I think thing. Cleanliness, it's gonna be fresh. Yeah. yeah, cleanliness is the key for our birds as well as our dogs. Yep. So there's a couple interesting things that I think would be a little bit tricky uh, that the AKC said, I love this one. This would never happen with my dogs, no matter how well-trained they are. 
teach your dog to leave it. <laughs> yeah, not going to happen. Very <laughs> Especially if you're not out there to reinforce it. I'm sure there are some dogs out there that are very well trained and their owners work with them constantly to teach them this. But, you know, the everyday dog owner does not. So this would be a very tricky one, unless you're outside with them. If you're outside with them, most likely if you've worked on this uh, cue with them, they would they would uh, do that um, in your presence. And then the last uh, key thing was enjoy the beauty of birds without feeding them, like you said. Yeah. Or maybe it's in a fenced in area that's mm -hmm. near your house that your dogs can't get to. Um, some of the things that we've done in the past, too, on our front area is we've because we put composting down in the fall is we've used the ski um, fencing so the dogs can't get in there we could have the bird feed in there the seeds falling down granted if it's an area you're trying to plant it might you know not be conducive to that but it is a protected area again where you can still watch your birds close to your home and your dogs can't get to the seeds that fall down so that's another idea that's a great idea yeah um, i want to just mention quickly um, in terms of your placement of your feeders for the birds protection uh, because we often have uh, injuries or, or fatalities with window strikes. Birds see the reflection of the woods or other vegetation and they think they can either fly in it for safety to escape a predator or it's someplace they can uh, you know, go and hang out to rest for a little bit. So if you're finding that you're having some window strikes where you put your feeders, you should move them. Uh, 30 feet away from a window is probably enough space for them to realize that it's something um, that they are not going to seek shelter from or having feeders within three feet of the window because then there's a destination as the birds are starting to fly in. They have a place that they're going to. And if for some reason you notice, uh, like I have a, a slider that is just in a bad position. So what I've done is I've just created like a big pot and I put branches and different sticks in it. So it breaks that reflection up. So that's one way to deal with window strikes, but be aware if you're finding uh, a dead bird or a bird injured right outside, it's, if it's hit the window, kind of keep an eye on that. You may have to move your feeders or put some other type of barrier to break that reflection up, decals or something, like I said, outside to break that reflection. And that's what I use is the decals. It has like yeah. um, a nice image on one side that's softer mm -hmm. when you have it looking in the home, but it's a little bit brighter on the other side. So birds see it as they're approaching. And I've never had a window strike anytime I've had decals um, yeah. up that I, they, they work really well and they're um, relatively inexpensive, which is nice. Yeah. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And uh, just a, a quick note too, of uh, the number one predator, the number one uh, threat to birds are outdoor cats. Um, again, uh, that is something that I feel very strongly if you are wanting to feed the birds and you have an outdoor cat, I think you need to choose. So please, I would encourage you if you do have outdoor cats to just enjoy the birds at a distance in the woods and not to entice them to your yard and then kind of set them up as well as your animal too, because um, you know, there can be some dangerous situations with cats being outside. Um, so, you know, the, especially this time of year, we've got hungry coyotes. We have, there's a lot of predators, even owls that could potentially be a threat to your cat. So um, you know, kind of keep that in mind too. I have a neighbor's cat that, that wanders over. So I've had to take my feeders in if it really gets bad, because I don't feel that's responsible of me to entice the birds in and then have them subjected to this threat. Yeah. I appreciate that you bring that up. Um, we, our cats don't like to go out in the winter, so it works out well when they come in, the bird feeders go out. When spring comes, the bird feeders go away and the cats uh, go back outside. So yeah, I think you've got to strike that balance there and yeah. what's important. Otherwise, yeah, it's a free meal for the cats, unfortunately. Right. So let's see, uh, Christine says um, she's participated in the bird backyard count for Audubon that you had mentioned. Excellent. And Jamie has a question for you about bears. <laughs> she said, we had a bear that knocked our feeder down in late winter, early spring. I'm still freaked out taking Cody, their dog, out at night. So can you kind of give us the hard fast rule in regards to when feeders can go up and when they should come down? Well, Jamie, it used to be November 1st up until a couple of years ago. Now it's arbitrarily December 1st and April 1st tends to be that time that you're safe leaving, leaving them up throughout the winter until April 1st. Again, I have, um, I have a wildlife camera in my backyard. We have a beautiful footage of the most gorgeous big male bear December 16th, a couple of years ago in the snow. I tracked him through the woods. 
he took my feeders down. So they have, they have incredible sense of smell. They're probably the land mammal with the strongest sense of smell, amazing memories. So if they've hit you before, if they've taken down feeders before, they will be back. Um, I think if you're, if you're not sure if the bears around you have gone into hibernation, then I would wait another couple of weeks before putting your feeders out. But once it gets really cold and in another two weeks, you should be safe. Um, but I would, again, target that April 1st date for having them come in. I've, I've been a little lazy on some years and, and gotten hit April 5th. <laughs> so it's like the, the bears like kind of know like, okay, yeah, I turned into April now. It's time to go out and stock up for the spring. Um, but yeah, bears I think bears are extremely um, shy. They're, they will not attack us. They're, they're scared unlike you know, a grizzly or a, one of the Kodiak bears. So making noise when you're outside with, with Cody might be the best uh, way if you're kind of talking and making noise, they hear us, sense, they smell us long before we even know they're there. So uh, that would deter them if they still are around. Yeah, and the weather in November was so mild. We still yeah. had, uh, you know, quite quite a bout with uh, ticks as we were on our walks and hikes and things mm -hmm. like that. So, you know, if, if we're experiencing that mild weather and the ticks are still out and they're not out in the leaf litter uh, getting ready for the winter, then, yeah, it's right. not, just not a good time to put those yeah. feeders out. So it could have been, Jamie, too, that, you know, the, the time the bears came to knock down your feeders, we could have had a warm you know, a late winter, early spring, and they just were out early in your area. And that's, that's gotta be what happened. But yeah, just being really mindful of that calendar and what the weather is doing is, is your best bet. Yeah. I'd go more by the weather than these, these arbitrary calendar dates, especially with climate change, things are really, they're um, adapting pretty quickly as far as uh, what they need to do with the weather. Exactly. Uh, somebody says, I have found many bird feeders deep in the woods while working free lunch. <laughs> yep. <laughs> yep. No, I, yep. There's like I a little collection it. of them out there. So if you need one, just go out to the woods. <laughs> I can't tell you how many suet feeders I have retrieved in my woods after December 1st. <laughs> exactly. Uh, Jamie says, yikes, our neighbors feed year round. So after that happened, we stopped. I think it was in early mid-March when it visited, but I would love to put our feeder out again. Yeah. Yeah. I think, Jamie, like if you really, again, I get this. I, I've had bear in my yard and it is unnerving. I've been out at night looking at a water garden and I've I've seen bear in the woods and it can be unnerving. So if you give it another couple of weeks to just be sure, you'll be safe come mid-December. Yep. I think that makes sense. So, Kelly, do we want to tell people a little bit about what they can expect at the bird walk on December 4th? Sure. So this, um, for those of you who have not joined us on this trail, um, meeting at the Massabesic Audubon Center, and then we go down into the Lake Massabesic Waterworks, the trail system is, is spectacular. So we'll be going through several habitats, and we'll be going out to what we call Battery Point. It's a peninsula of land that's surrounded on three sides by Lake Massabesic. The water is not frozen yet, so we should expect to see some waterfowl, some sort of late season ducks, hopefully some bald eagles because they are starting to come to open water at this point, as well as a lot of these little mixed winter flocks of birds. So there should be a variety of birds in the habitat, the hemlock forest, which are a great sheltering area. So we'll talk about um, you know, what you'll expect to see. We'll go into more depth about winter strategies. And this walk is really rich in wildlife. So not only birds, but other things that we'll be able to see. Um, and I think it's fun because, again, I'm feeling that holiday stress of, oh, my gosh, there's so much to do. I'm just putting Thanksgiving away, Christmas, the, you know, I'm still <laughs> dealing with pumpkins. The tree's not up yet. So I'm looking forward to taking this opportunity for a couple of hours, connecting with some awesome people, getting some fresh air, just sort of resetting my holiday clock so that I'm looking forward to the holidays rather than that dread. Agreed. And if you have not joined us on one of our nature walks yet with Kelly, then you have missed out on her awesome <laughs> bird calls. You will, you will be delighted and you will, yeah, you will, uh, you have the greatest, I think there's, there's no bird that you can't tackle as far as a call is concerned. <laughs> I promise you a barred owl folks. <laughs> oh, very nice. Okay, good. So yeah, so Massabesic Audubon Center is a beautiful area. It looks like it's going to be a decent day too. I think high thirties. Yeah, it's just perfect. So when we go out at, at 10 o'clock, it will be it will be crisp, but it's not going to be frigid. I think the winds will die down. So it's that beautiful early winter, early December day. Exactly. 
So if you guys are still interested, we do still have some tickets available. You can go to our website at nhdog.club and just go to our events and activities uh, link or tab, I should say, and then scroll down to that event and uh, go ahead and grab a ticket. So Kelly, if people want to learn more about you and nature education opportunities, how can they find out more? I think, uh, Tracy, in the Facebook or the Instagram posting, I think you had the information from my website. You can go on my website, and I do have links there to my Instagram and my Facebook and my LinkedIn pages. I've been putting up some what I think is some kind of fun videos on Instagram, so I'd love for you to join me there and check those out, some ways that I'm teaching how to use nature to disconnect and de-stress from the craziness that we're in right now, especially in the midst of COVID surging again. So. Um, I would love to have you join me on Instagram and share your thoughts. That's perfect. Yeah, I love the videos that you've done. They're very informative, very relaxing, too. You just have, you know, as a wellness coach, you just have that way of talking that relaxes people. Oh, okay. <laughs> My daughter, who's doing her PhD in San Francisco, she said, Mom, everybody in lab, like if they get stressed, they, they listen to one of your, your uh, Instagram videos. That's perfect. <laughs> in the West Coast. <laughs> well, thank you very much, Kelly, for joining us tonight and for sharing all this great information. We really appreciate it. Oh, thank, thank you to you. everybody who asked questions. I hope you learned a little bit more information from uh, Kelly tonight. Uh, Christine, who was one of our, on one of our last bird walks, <laughs> uh, Kelly says, very impressive bird calling. Absolutely, Christine. I have some news. We'll see you this weekend. <laughs> All right, everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight, and hopefully we'll see you on Saturday. Have great. a great evening. Thank Bye. you, Jason. Bye-bye.